Today's episode is with Roy Dean. Roy Dean is a visual artist, but even more important, he's a martial artist. And he's been able to start up academies, both in person, you know, old brick and mortar, and digital. And what's truly fascinating about all of this is that it's emphasis has been on Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Now, obviously, he studied judo and other things. And while this may be a business podcast, keep in mind, he was running a business and still is, right? And why this is relevant to you is because as we become a more and more digitized world, we come to terms with the fact that all of us are also working remote a lot these days. What are we supposed to do? We know we need to move more. We know we need to do more. Well, I just happen to have a conversation that is truly genuine and insightful, not only focused on martial arts, but how it parlays to but how it parlays to internal discipline, which as we all know, martial artists have, the good ones do. And how we can parlay that into the way we move and operate in the world as entrepreneurs. If you've been on the fence about, you know, getting active and signing up to the gym again and things of that nature, look no further than this conversation. I guarantee by the end of it, you will be moved and inspired to want to do more and to reconnect with people, which is one of the values that Roy Dean kept sharing throughout this conversation. It's a truly, truly humble, personable, real, and insightful conversation. Without belaboring the point and without further ado, Roy Dean. My man, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, I think you may be the first martial artist officially that I've uh, uh, interviewed on this podcast, which is awesome. And uh, I think with that said, when we look at your background, it's not only martial arts. We've got digital artists, an educator, you know, a media developer. You've got a very well-rounded background. So when I was asking myself, what are the, what's like the first thing I could ask you, right? I think, I think the, the thing that made the most sense for me was how far back does this willingness to face the world, which is what a martial artist does, right? Mm -hmm. The willingness to face the world, which is a kinship with entrepreneurship. How far back does this go for you? Uh, when you were a kid, did you like, they, they put you in to self-defense courses or is this something you elected for yourself? I would say it's something that I elected for myself. Um, the big turning point for me was when I was 16. I was... You know, as a teenager, I was coming into my own. But when I was 16, I wanted to go out of Alaska. I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, and I wanted to do something um, adventurous. So I signed up for a Rotary Exchange program. And this Rotary Club ended up sending me to Japan. So once I was in Japan, I was, it was one very disorienting. Um, there was a lot of input in, not a lot of output on my part. I couldn't read the signs. Uh, I wasn't sure where I was. I didn't speak Japanese. You know, that came over the course of the year. But it was something that uh, really was a shock to my system. And studying judo over there, they encouraged me to do a Japanese art after school. That started me down the martial arts path. And was a real wake up call that I could do. I was tougher than I thought. You can do more than you expect when you're put into a situation where you really have to adapt. So that gave me license to do almost anything for a year. If I could live in Japan for a year, then I could, you know, go and do this for a year. I could live in the dojo of a Japanese jujitsu master for a year. I could go to university for a year and see if I liked it. I could try things uh, without it being something permanent that I had to commit to. It was something I could try and investigate. This is big, man. Uh, you know, I, I have a genuine question about discipline that comes from that, right? Because entrepreneurs are set aside. Uh, well, you shuffle between those who are and who aren't entrepreneurs via their ability to be disciplined, right? Mm -hmm. And I believe the same goes with any martial artist that uh, is serious about what they do. There's just no way to get better unless you have discipline. Now, my mm -hmm. question here, though, is, is discipline a byproduct of the environment and the accountability that you have from a, you know, a sensei, you know, a sifu, you know, a, a teacher and your classmates? Or is this something that, is from the individual themselves because often 
people find it easier to be held accountable by a group or an outside external force versus mm -hmm. the individual. But what is the true discipline and, and, and what was your first sort of experience with truly saying to yourself that you have discipline or accepting that reality of discipline? The discipline that comes with martial arts is largely internal. However, there's a lot of external factors. Um, occasionally, like rank can be a motivating factor. But I think the pleasure that attracts you in obtaining a rank, it's, it's a little bit too far, um, especially in an art like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Other martial arts, they have the incentives a little bit closer to you. But in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's usually like one or two, it's usually two years in between each belt, sometimes longer. So then it starts becoming less about that pleasure that's attracting you and more about the pains that you are experiencing on a daily basis. So those pains drive you to get better, learn the fundamental movements, learn how to be a good student, to pay attention in class, to be consistent because of the pains, like in, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, they have a sparring component and it doesn't feel good to lose. Even as a beginner, it's, it can be fun. It's exhilarating to get on the mat and wrestle and there's an adrenaline dump and it's, it's enjoyable. But once you turn that corner and actually start, you know, submitting people or winning matches, it's really a great feeling and you want to keep that going. So you say, okay, I had a little success here. What do I need to do to keep that going? Like, ah, if I switched up my diet a little bit, I think I would do better. If I got a little bit more sleep. If I started doing a little bit of weightlifting or maybe some Olympic lifts outside, I think that would help. Maybe if I got this instructional, that would give me the key because I'm not sure what they're throwing at me. So you start adding up. It's, it's like a tipping point that, that comes along. It's many little things, usually to stave off a pain that allows you to, and then before you know it, you have a momentum in your life. And the discipline is kind of self-fulfilling. Yeah, man. See, this is, what, this is what I wanted to hear because entrepreneurship, as you know firsthand as well, is one of those things where the ranks are too far, right? The rewards are too far, and you're most likely going to experience pain first. Mm -hmm. And so to hear that there is an art that gets close to that feeling where it encourages you to get that experience, to get in there and to get hurt, but calculated, right? You don't want to just leave yes. yourself open, but calculated to learn and to iterate and to pivot. Uh, I once heard someone, and I, I wish I could remember right now, but they said a, a true pivot is not a change of vision, but a change of tactic or approach, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for me to hear you sort of give that analogy of discipline with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and that feeling and what is the intrinsic motivational factor, I feel like this is there's a lot there that entrepreneurs can pull from and who may be encouraged to look at uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructionals or take a course or this or that. Uh, so now that we're here on this topic, uh, I happen to know that you also make courses. So how did that transition go? So you're sitting there, you're studying, right? And I know we're jumping really far ahead here, um, but we're here now. So where does business and like, where do you go from the student to becoming a, a business person, an entrepreneur? Like, how did that change occur for you? Was it all in Japan or did you come back to the States before doing so? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. When I was 16, I went to Japan. I came back at 17. I continued to train in various martial arts. Uh, I was into Aikido, and then I apprenticed myself to a Japanese jiu-jitsu master in Monterey, California. I got really serious about it. And I lived there. I wrote a book about that experience called The Martial Apprentice. And then I was also exposed to Brazilian jiu-jitsu through the UFC. So. I started training under one of the first Brazilians teaching that art in California. His name was Claudio Franza. So I was just a student, student, student for a long time. Then after a while, I realized I, sh I should go back to school. You know, I've kind of lived my martial arts fantasy. And I went to UC San Diego. I graduated. They had a kind of an experimental degree in interdisciplinary computing and the arts major. 
where you could either specialize in visual arts or audio. So I was into music when I was younger, grew up playing the piano and composition. So I, I was doing this kind of music, computer music thing. Hired as an audio engineer after graduating from university. And at this, it was kind of a, we did a lot of different kinds of productions. We did, you know, some shows for direct TV. We did some commercials. We did some, a lot of corporate work as well. Very glossy. And I learned how to fit it, uh, do video editing as, as well. In addition to, you know, selecting music and recording. And so I said, Oh man, I think I have the total package here. And this was coming up at a time when computer technology was, was kind of, um, allowing software to do what hardware used to do. And I was also coming to kind of a dissatisfaction with my audio engineering career. I was 30 years old and I, I just thought, this is not it. I don't want to be in a windowless music studio for the rest of my life. I felt kind of out of balance. So I decided to, when I got my black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which was happening a few months, in a few months, I thought about quitting my job. And then I took a trip to Yosemite, which really reaffirmed that I should quit my job and open a Jiu Jitsu Academy and leverage. Jiu Jitsu is all about leverage, right? You want to be in the right position. And I figured I could be in the right position with my media skills to be able to leverage my name, my brand, um, through this, particularly through this new medium called YouTube. So I started doing, um, my first real instructional didn't really hit. It was called, you know, seminars year one. And it had some seminars that I did, my instructor did. It was good. It was kind of an introductory thing. But my second video that I made was called Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Blue Belt Requirements. And it's considered to be kind of the best beginner instructional ever made. Um, and that completely changed my life. And the, the ability to be able to create something that was very succinct, very clear, and helped people with their need to study this art. Because people were hot on this art. They were watching people. It's a fundamental discipline you have to know if you wanted to go into MMA or the UFC. If you don't know jiu-jitsu, you're going to get smoked. You know, you can't just know jiu-jitsu, but you need to be a well-rounded fighter. And this is one of the aspects. And people are drawn to that ability to fight, to defend themselves. Yet it's short of MMA where you're getting punched in the face. So there was a real need in the community for this knowledge. And I was able to fulfill that need, leveraging both my technical expertise in jiu-jitsu and my media background. Um, so it ended up being a great fit. And that, that launched me in a new direction. I love how that parlayed, how you made that happen, because in a similar vein, I myself had done so many other things that taught me audio or video editing. So I can firsthand relate to how that sets you apart. And, and as you start getting into, into the business world, it's super cool to hear you do it the way that you did, though, because that meant you also understood exactly what angle was necessary to view the technique in a way that would actually reveal the understanding to put it into practice, even from a remote experience like video. I imagine you had a lot of fun trying to translate what you saw in your mind over into something that was media consumable. Was that, was it difficult to get that to happen, even though you had the know-how because you had to experiment to, to land it just the way you wanted it to? Because now we're talking about mm. products, right? It is. It's about creating a product that is rewatchable, right? I once had, this is years, years later when I sold my academy, I had a, I had a jujitsu student write me from Germany. They had just been promoted to black belt and they wanted to write me and let me know how much of that particular, that blue belt requirements DVD, how much it influenced them. They had watched it over a thousand times. Whoa. They watched it every day. It was kind of like a mental meditation for them so they could embody the techniques. And that kind of connection with the audience where 
where I was able to deliver something that really satisfied a need. And I was able to do it in a really clear way. I, you know, I could edit in between. I would do it from multiple angles. And no one had to wait for people to switch position. I just did it cleanly. Boom, there it is. And people could take that and then drill with partners in their own. A lot of servicemen, too, whether they were in Afghanistan or Iraq, they didn't have access to instruction. But they were able to use that, grab somebody, stay active, get their mind off the conflict, be in their own zone for a minute. Uh, so I've always been trying to raise the bar when it comes to martial arts instruction. So creatively, even after that, I would try to do the next title was like purple belt requirements. And I tried to make it conceptual and, you know, brown belt, black belt. And I've had a variety of other instructionals um, from that point. But I'm always trying to raise the bar and communicate, not just techniques, because the techniques are good. But that's not going to motivate somebody to take up the art. What's motivating for them is an emotional response. So if you couple storytelling, I have some videos uh, on YouTube that are black belt demonstrations. So I give, especially when people are getting their black belt, it's a big deal. And I want to include not only them, but their family, their friends, the people that have sacrificed their loved one going off for years and devoting hours and hours and hours each week to this study, which often they're kind of like a jujitsu widow, you know, so much time is necessary to, to really advance in this art that I want them on that there that day when we test them, they do a demonstration of skill, they spar with some people, they always finish with me, you know, they got to beat the, the final boss. And then I take that story of their struggle and then do some slick editing and some really careful music choices to evoke this emotional response. So people are inspired at the end of it. And whether they go with that inspiration to their local academy or they simply get interest in the art or if they just have a positive impression of the art, that's enough. That's, that's the mission to kind of spread how this art can change people's lives. It's changed my life in innumerable ways. And I've been able to help influence other people to get involved in the art as well. So in a way, it went from creating a product that served a need to really trying to inspire people because jujitsu is part of the answer for our society. I mean, we need, we have too many screens, not enough real life connection. That's big, man. Yeah. Very, very well said. You know, you have an ability to tell stories. Where does this come from? Uh, is this something that you sort of practice intentionally? Or is it something that as a visual artist, it started to develop as you had to understand how to translate visually and with the audio as well? Did it sort of come hand in hand for you? I, I think it has. I, I think it's developed over the years. My main jujitsu instructor, Roy Harris, who just received, he's the first, second actually non-Brazilian to, re, to receive his seventh degree black belt. That just happened this last weekend. Mm. He has been a pioneer and he is an amazing communicator. He can capture the room and bring people in um, with his words. And he's, he's an incredible storyteller. So all students are a reflection of their teacher. And I definitely have copped some of his, you know, linguistic idiosyncrasies and his speaking style, but also from my other Japanese jiu-jitsu instructor, um, Julio Toribio, he was an incredibly charismatic man. And, you know, he was able to, to present things in a way that included people, made them feel welcome. He was very warm and you know, when you can take multiple influences like that, that have been great teachers, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not a surprise that I've been able to effectively communicate my message to students as well. 
you know, when I um, when I was learning uh, Wing Chun, and I know it's controversial in martial arts to study that versus another art or whatever. I personally, I, I just enjoyed the experience myself. But I remember my instructor, my Sifu, telling me that uh, the fight begins and ends in the mind and in your ability to communicate, whether like to avoid the conflict to begin oh. with and to win with words, right? And I believe mm-hmm. I, I hear when you speak and the commanding of the room and and you know p- taking people in and that that in itself is is an art, right? And uh, and I hear that in you. So when you face an obstacle in your business, uh, when you're looking at your e-learning uh, company and you know uh, you sold, you said you sold your your uh, your academy, what would you do internally to overcome those obstacles? If we could just borrow the mind of a businessman slash, uh, you know, martial artist, what is that technique or how do you get yourself out of that and over that? That's a great question. I would say that I take the approach that you do in jujitsu or that you come to understand in jujitsu, which is, you know, typically people see an obvious road. Uh, and they try to go down that road. And if the road is unobstructed, okay, they can complete the journey. But very often, you encounter an obstacle. Now, the answer is usually not, you have to test out that obstacle. You like, you, you push it, okay, there's resistance there. Sometimes it's just an absolute brick wall. And a lot of people say, okay, I need to marshal more energy and use force to break through. I'm going to destroy that wall. But over time, you learn that that's not really the answer. Um, You need to be not, you need to be less ideological and more practical. So you say, okay, I'm blocked this way. Let me turn 90 degrees. And then I can move parallel to it. I can be unobstructed. I need to change my direction because that path isn't working then you might be able to just go up a little bit and then turn the corner again and be able to beat the obstruction or the obstacle. It's all about a careful pivot in the right direction. Sometimes sometimes you can go over the obstruction. Sometimes you can go around the obstruction. Sometimes you can go under the obstruction. There are more ways to overcome an obstacle than you might originally think. It's usually not force on force or fighting it with power. It's about finding a creative solution that may not be obvious. So when you find a, a solution in, if you're looking for a solution in business and you hit a wall, oh, my ads aren't giving me a good ROI right now. Okay, what should I do? Should I put more money into it? Not enough people are seeing it? No, I don't think that's the answer. I think maybe you should mix up your creative. I think maybe we're targeting the wrong demographic. I think we need to iterate and change a couple of variables and see how that does without full commitment. And like an early jujitsu student, they know a few things, so they have great confidence in it and they go for it with 100% intensity and and like commitment. Whereas a more advanced student, say a brown belt or a black belt, everything's a probe. You're pushing here, no, it's a block. Oh, I'm gonna push over here, oh, it's a block. I'm gonna push here, oh, it's empty. And then you can follow through. And you didn't waste a lot of energy. Yeah, you had to use a little bit to explore this avenue, that avenue. But it's not a full commitment and there's no emotional attachment to it either. Because you have options, you're able to, you know, be more clinical, analyze. Oh, not that road, not that road. Oh, this one worked out. And then try to take advantage of the opportunity that's open for you. That's amazing, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for breaking that down. I, I, I really felt like that was the heart of this conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I really felt that was the heart of this conversation because of how it addresses a lot of what you've come to learn. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. And I imagine uh, anyone can take that as a, an implication of what your programs are like. Uh, so I'd love to get into that a little bit more. Are you, did you also sell your, your, your programs, uh, and move on to something else? Or are you still currently working on that and, and where can people find those instructionals and more? Yeah. So I decided years ago, I sold my original academy, physical academy, uh, that was in Oregon. And then I decided to just at that time, I had kind of risen to a level where I could just have affiliated academies. So I have 
a number of academies all over the place. I have one in Russia, Norway, all over the U.S., a few in Canada. Um, and so I have been focusing on helping my affiliates, teaching the teachers. And I've maintained my e-learning company, RoyDean.Academy. So there we have a number of the instructionals I've produced over the years. Some of them are, you know, I wouldn't say I get bored easily, but I'm always trying to raise the bar. I'm always trying to do something different. That's where the juice is for me, to do something creative, to do something innovative. So I have this body of work that I have, um, and it's available in multiple formats. You can get it through apps, you know, iOS, Android. I just want my content to be distributed everywhere. You can get it um, through an OTT channel, over-the-top channel, uh, subscription-based. RoyDean.VHX.TV, but mainly RoyDean.Academy is my new favorite platform because I, f I feel like the user interface and the user experience is superior. And I have I've essentially coalesced all of my instructionals into various courses. So we have the Blue Belt course, that's for beginners. The Purple Belt course for intermediate students, Brown Belt course, and then a path to black belt. So path to black belt includes all of my instructionals and all the ones that I'm going to produce in the future. So it's kind of like a lifetime access um, pass. So I feel that people that enroll in these courses get the best of both worlds. For example, with the blue belt course, I have that what's considered to be the best beginner instructional of all time, blue belt, and then I did a 4K updated version of it called Blue Belt 2.0, plus some seminars, plus some other things that help really support uh, people in that fundamental stage where they're learning to fall in love with the art. You can waste a lot of energy going down the wrong pathways in jujitsu because there's so much information. Back in the day, we didn't have enough information. So that was the issue. And we were starved for every drop and you would drive miles or I would videotape tournaments and like study the moves that guys were using. Nowadays with YouTube and everyone's putting out content, there's a million techniques, but that is the problem. What do you focus on? It's about clearing things away as opposed to just cramming everything in. So I think I can provide a really clear path for people that that want to go down this road, study Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Maybe they want to do it for self-defense, but you know, usually those reasons fall by the wayside. They get into the chess match. They get into the kind of physical and intellectual pursuit. And it's a challenge. It's, it's not easy. So a lot of people that like difficult things get involved in this art. And um, if I can make that, that journey a little bit easier, then my mission is accomplished. Epic. And I'm going to be looking at what you've got going on out there too, I man. Uh, RoyDean.Academy, you said, right? RoyDean.Academy. Yeah, that'd be the easiest one. And uh, I love that you have it in various formats and different channels that people can access uh, because you just never know what someone's looking for. And you've covered all bases. There is one thing I want to ask before we close things out that I believe you are uniquely qualified to answer based on the work that you've been doing and where we drove this conversation, and that is the building, nurturing, and management of a community or tapping into communities. This is something by default because of the nature of your work and what you do uh, had to be learned, uh, inspected, probed, as you said. What was that like uh, for you to, to start to realize the, the power of a community and the importance of nurturing it? Mm -hmm. Great question. I will go back and shine some light on my professor, Roy Harris. At a time when a lot of people involved in the art just wanted you to go compete, get a gold medal, bring some glory back to the academy, he was, he was all about community, building a community, being a leader, what it takes to be a leader in a community. Because most people do this art as a as a hobby. And what ha happens is you start to develop kind of a tribal mentality. 
within the academy. And that is something that we need desperately in the society. So nurturing that community, the local community, is extremely important. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can do that by being warm and and friendly to the people that come in, welcoming the new students, protecting the women so they have a fighting chance to learn some techniques so they can hang with the men. You know, and what are you doing when you're doing that? You are, by having one woman on the mat, you are encouraging other women. It's very difficult to be that first one. But if you can get one and then treat her like gold, get her up to a certain level, she will attract other women. And that isn't, I mean, who needs it more? Who needs this kind of martial art more? It's about being able to overcome stronger and more athletic opponents. And there are ways to do it. You just need to be um, in the game long enough to understand how to do it. So you protect your community members until they get to a certain level. And then there's kind of a life of its own. Now, I don't deal with, I'm a member of a tribe here. I, I, I don't have a, a, a main facility anymore, but I do work out of a couple of different clubs, including my, my friends at uh, Coachella Valley Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Judo, CVBJJ. And they have an incredible tribe and I'm part of that tribe and I'm a leader in that tribe. And it's important to, to like foster the right kind of friendly environment where magic can happen on the mat and people can get together and trust each other because that is a network, a community network where, Hey, if you need something done, Oh man, I need my garage door fixed. Oh yeah. I talked to Hector, you know, Oh, I need something. I need something done. You have a medical issue. We got doctors. That is old fashioned in a way, you know, you know, all the people in the village and you know what they're good at. So nurturing that local community is important. I also have an international community and we do that generally through digital means. So every Monday I connect with my affiliates. I tell them what I'm up to, what's going on troops. This is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. I can't wait to see this person. You know, it's staying connected because they are the local leaders of their own tribes. And so there are different levels. Just getting involved in art, you're a student. Then you might be a competitor. Then you might be assistant instructor. Then you might be an instructor. Then you might be an academy head. Then you might be an organizational head. You know, these are all levels of, you know, societal relationships. And whatever level you, you get involved with, it's about being involved and creating meaningful relationships with people. Um, I used to think it was about winning. I used to think it was about tapping people. It's not about that. It's about moving, getting bodies in motion and connecting with people on the mat. Man, I, I hope that the people who are listening were inspired the way I am to be outside more connecting locally with people or getting people, getting to know people around you. Uh, like you said, fostering that uh, sense of touch and being back to being human again, while appreciating the advances in technology. And those are great. We cannot forget what brought us to be able to create technology like that. And, and it was being a part of people and uh, sort of the lessons you imparted with uh, probing uh, when facing an obstacle instead of giving full commitment so that you can use the amount of energy that is required no more, no less. And to sit there and understand that you can take what your journey has given you and put it all together if you just took the time to reflect on how they all fit together and probe for where that may fit in the world. And you may find yourself surprised, as I'm sure you did, that you were able to provide something for people who truly needed it all from your own life. I think this was a beautiful conversation and I can't thank you enough right, for, for stopping by and for sharing that with us. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate the time, Philip.